artificial stone-associated silicosis. The risk of accelerated silicosis in workers installing kitchen and bathroom worktops. Silicosis and mycobacterium disease. Silicosis is still a major threat for workers in developing countries. Technological advances over the past half century, including wet drilling and improved ventilation, have contributed to substantially reducing the occurrence of silicosis among miners and other dust exposed workers. Hundreds of cases are, however, still identified each year in Europe and the USA. 1,2 and silicosis is a major threat for workers in developing countries. Low salaries and less restricting and or less enforced occupational hygiene standards have attracted many environmentally and occupationally demanding productions. 3 and facilitated mining initiatives in developing countries. 4. On the other hand, the reappearance of silicosis in wealthy Western countries has resulted from the extension of occupational health surveillance to previously under-scrutinized small or family-owned businesses, and the immigration and illegal employment of non-unionized workforce from developing countries. Furthermore, the progressive clearing of the dark and thick cloud of silicosis cases, has been accompanied by the emergence of other diseases such as lung cancer, kidney failure, and immune system disorders, one which has rekindled the interest in silica research. The interaction between physical and biological entities is complex. As in many other fields of science, it seems that the more we progress in knowledge, the more we realize the complexity of the interaction between physical and biological entities. Such a complexity is viewed differently from different perspectives, as reflected by the diverse philosophy underlying the OSHA dust permissible exposure limit, which is flexible depending on the silica content in respirable dust, 5 mg M3 in the absence of silica, in respect to the 50 mg M3 NIOSH silica recommended exposure limit and the silica AGI threshold limit value which are independent on its dilution in respirable dust. Studies of dose-response effects following silica exposure have traditionally relied on simple cumulative exposure estimates, in which silica concentration and duration of exposure, in years, have been given the same weight. Cumulative silica exposure was the best predictor of disease followed by duration of exposure and average exposure among South Dakota gold miners. 5 The linear dose response of silicosis risk by cumulative exposure has also been used as an indirect validation of exposure assessment among Chinese miners. 6 Summary estimates of cumulative exposure provided comparable results to estimates weighted by the time since the exposure occurred in a study of silicosis latency. 7 On the other hand, a five-fold range in silicosis risk by type of trade was shown among Chinese workers in association with comparable levels of cumulative exposure to silica. 6 And while Nisdo and Sluis Screamer found that no silicosis occurred when cumulative exposure was below 0.9 mg M3 years among South African gold miners. 8 No cumulative exposure category was exempted from risk of silicosis in the South Dakota gold miners cohort. 5 South Dakota cases with lowest cumulative exposure were exposed in the most recent years. Lower levels, and had short duration of exposure, which would suggest that some men get silicosis after only brief exposure to low levels. Short-term exposures to high silica concentrations might account for occurrence of silicosis at low cumulative or average exposure levels. However, in this issue of OEM, Buchanan et al. show that given comparable levels of cumulative silica exposure, a silica concentration above 2 mg M3, such as that which accidentally occurred in a Scottish colliery in the 1970s, is three times more effective in producing a 2-1 silicosis than concentrations below that level. 9 Therefore, short-term exposures to high silica concentrations might account for occurrence of silicosis at low cumulative or average exposure levels. If the change in silica concentration in the Scottish colliery were entirely explained by the accidental incursion of the coal-getting machinery in a silica-richer seam, and no major failure in dust control measures contributed, 
the observed increase in silica concentration occurred at a presumably constant level of respirable dust, that is, it should have most likely resulted from a greater percentage proportion of silica particles in respirable dust. A high silica content in respirable dust equates to a larger total physical surface interacting with the biological counterpart in the time unit, at a lesser grade of interference from associated non-silica particles, and for the same deposition pattern associated with an approximately constant average total respirable dust. Under such circumstances, a greater biological effect should be expected. The importance of the findings of Buchanan et al. is threefold. 1. It may be a plausible explanation for intertrade differences in risk of silicosis associated with similar cumulative exposures. 2. It implies the need for tighter schedules of silica monitoring in the workplace, and particularly in quarries and mines, where changes such as, as those occurring in the Scottish colliery are to be expected. 3. From a clinical perspective, it poses new questions on whether coal workers' pneumoponiosis CWP, is truly an individual clinical entity, as it appeared to be from early reports on the British coal mines, or whether it results from undetected silica exposure. Fibrogenicity and transforming activity are separate properties of silica. There is a fourth aspect. This points to a feasible strategy to account for the effect of various exposure circumstances in modifying the association between silica exposure and related health outcomes other than silicosis, particularly lung cancer. The 1997 ERC upgrading of silica to a Group 1 human carcinogen did not solve the uncertainty surrounding the circumstances in which silica behaves as a lung carcinogen. 10 meta analysis procedures consider interstudy variability as a random effect. Instead, if such variability results from differences in the biological activity of silica particles inhaled in diverse exposure circumstances, understanding why silica is a lung carcinogen in some workplaces, but not in others, ERC Group 3 includes coal dust, which may contain silica at substantial concentrations, as Buchanan et al. also report, is crucial to establish safe limits. Experimental studies have shown fibrogenicity and transforming activity to be separate properties of silica. 11 Mineralogical factors affecting the biological activity of silica particles, discussed by Guthrie, 12 include type of silica polymorph, enantiomorphic structure of quartz, metal contamination on the quartz surface, and variability in silica surfaces, including size and presence of sorbed cations affecting the ready availability of ionized selenol groups. Age of silica particles is also relevant, as fresh quartz surfaces generate active oxygen species, due to their abundance in siominous radicals. These and other factors, including particle morphology and immune function, modify the biological response to silica at comparable exposure levels. 13 Moreover, the type of interaction between silica particles and other components of the dust mixing, including other lung carcinogens, might be different from what is expected, as suggested by results from Chinese mines and pottery factories. 14. To summarize, biological properties of silica are expected to vary 1. by the mineralogical characteristics of silica itself, 2. by its dilution in total respirable dust, and 3 by the qualitative mineral composition of the dust mix. The history of occupational health has shown that we can reduce uses and intensity of exposure to respirable silica, but we cannot completely eliminate the occupational exposure to a basic component of our physical environment. If silicosis were the risk factor for lung cancer and immune disorders among silica-exposed workers, as numerous authors have proposed, Enforcing the current limits would protect against lung cancer risk as well. Models such as the one proposed by Buchanan et al. might help in understanding whether this is the case, or alternatively, what else we can do, together with reducing to the lowest achievable limit the environmental concentration of respirable silica, to prevent silica-related health effects other than silicosis. Silicosis is still a major threat for workers in developing countries. Chris M. Barber 1, David Fishwick 1, Martin J. Seed 2, Melanie Carter 2, 
Marty Van Trongeren 2. Author Affiliations Center for Workplace Health, Health, and Safety Executive, Buxton, UK Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, The University of Manchester, Manchester, UK Correspondence to Dr. Chris M. Barber, Center for Workplace Health, Health, and Safety Executive, Harper Hill, Buxton SK179JN, UK, Chris.Barber at hsl.gsi.gov.uk dx.doi.org web link Artificial stone is an increasingly popular material used to fabricate kitchen and bathroom benchtops. Cutting and grinding artificial stone is associated with generation of very high levels of respirable crystalline silica, and the frequency of cases of severe silicosis associated with this exposure is rapidly increasing. Aim to report the characteristics of a clinical series of Australian workers with artificial stone-associated silicosis. Methods Respiratory physicians voluntarily reported cases of artificial stone-associated silicosis identified in their clinical practices. Physicians provided information including occupational histories, respiratory function tests, chest radiology and histopathology reports, when available. Results 7 male patients were identified with a median age of 44 years, range 26 to 61. All were employed in small kitchen and bathroom benchtop fabrication businesses with an average of 8 employees, range 2 to 20. All workplaces primarily used artificial stone, and dust control measures were poor. All patients were involved in dry cutting artificial stone. The median duration of exposure prior to symptoms was 7 years, range 4 to 10. Six patients demonstrated radiological features of progressive massive fibrosis. These individuals followed up over a median follow-up period of 16 months, IQR 21 months, demonstrated rapid decline in prebronchodilator forced expiratory volume in 1S of 386 milliliter slash year, SD204 milliliter, and forced vital capacity of 448 milliliter slash year. SD312 milliliter. Conclusions This series of silicosis in Australian workers further demonstrates the risk associated high silica content artificial stone. Effective dust control and health surveillance measures need to be stringently implemented and enforced in this industry. dx.doi.org web link. Danger at work, occupational lung disease and asthma. P221 silicosis and mycobacterium disease, is it a problem in the UK? C. Hayden, J. Hoyle. Author Affiliations North Manchester General Hospital, Manchester, UK. Abstract Introduction and Objectives An association between silicosis and mycobacterium disease is well reported globally particularly amongst gold miners. One, The rate of mycobacterium infection in silicosis cases in the last 15 years in the UK is unclear. The aim of this study was to establish the frequency of either tuberculosis DB, or non-tuberculous mycobacterium NTM, disease in a UK cohort. Methods and Occupational Lung Disease Database, 2004-2017, identified those with an MBT diagnosis of silicosis. Case notes were examined. Results 22 patients were identified. 100% men, mean age 59.1 years, 24 to 83, and mean length of silica exposure of 23.0 years, 2 to 51. 63.6% were current or ex-smokers with a mean pack year history of 27.1 pack years, 5 to 40. Figure 1 shows the relevant occupational history. 5, 22.7%, had an obstructive pattern of spirometry, 5, 22.7%, restrictive, 5, 22.7%, mixed and 7, 31.9%. Normal spirometry. Mean FEV1 was 79% predicted, 29% to 106%, at presentation and FVC 90% predicted, 48% to 116%. 
36.4% of patients had evidence of progressive massive fibrosis on chest radiology at presentation. 18.2% of patients were classified as accelerated silicosis, onset within 10 years of exposure. 19 of 22, 86.4%, silicosis cases identified had actively been screened for TB. 6 of 22, 27.3%, received antimycobacterium treatment. 5 of 6 received empirical treatment for TB prior to a diagnosis of silicosis being confirmed, of these two later relapsed and had NTM confirmed and treated. The other patient received empirical treatment for TB while awaiting lung transplantation and subsequently died of pulmonary TB. 3 of 6 had NTM grown on at least one occasion. Abstract P221 Figure 1 Download Figure Open in new tab. Download PowerPoint. Abstract P221 Figure 1. Occupations. N equals 22. Conclusion This study indicates that rates of TB and NTM in silicosis are relatively high, supporting previously published international data. In addition, this study also highlights the difficulty in diagnosis of TB slash NTM in silicosis due to similar clinical and radiological features, frequently leading to patients being treated empirically for TB and high relapse rates. The need for lung transplantation in accelerated disease may also necessitate careful screening for TB slash NTM. Reference Cowie RL the Epidemiology of Tuberculosis in Gold Miners with Silicosis. MJ Respercra Care Med 1994-155 Pints 1, 1460-1462. dx.doi.org web link.